more on Halo Talks NYC, I have the pleasure of having Dr. Elizabeth Stanley direct from Georgetown University. Her resume is much better looking than mine. Not only a Harvard and Yale and MIT grad, U.S. Army intelligence officer, and thankfully she's uh, also gotten into our Halo sector on the mindfulness side. We uh, tracked some of her recent uh, YouTube videos and her thoughts on people dealing with COVID. And uh, she has a book that just came out called Widen the Window. And I'm excited to uh, share her thoughts with our entire Halo community. So Liz, welcome to Halo Talks. Thank you so much for having me, Pete. It is such a pleasure to be here. Great. So, um, you know, you touch on a lot of different uh, facets of life and, and a number of different sectors. So maybe could you just give our audience a little bit of a lens into how you, you know, being a professor and being in the foreign service and intelligence side decided that, you know, you were going to write a book and focus on mindfulness <laughs> as well, just to kind of tie those together to start. You know, I don't think anyone writes about something that they don't need to learn themselves. It was certainly my own need to learn how to heal my own stress and trauma. You know, this, this book is about how to cope with stress and trauma, and it comes from my life experience, and then a whole lot of science research too. But you know, I experienced a lot of stress and trauma in my life, and I socialized, I, I coped with it the way most of us have been socialized to cope in our culture, which is just kind of pushing it under, compartmentalizing it, powering through. And my body eventually just said no. And the either apex or, you know, <laughs> bottom of the hole, whichever way you want to look at it, was when I lost my eyesight. And it was, you know, I had to learn a new way of being. So there's nothing that I write or teach about that I hadn't kind of learned first in my own mind and body. But as I've worked now with thousands of people in different high stress settings, from troops, you know, preparing to deploy to combat, to medical first responders, to police, to athletes, everybody has kind of misguided understandings of stress and trauma in our culture. And I wanted to both help people understand the science underneath it, because we have so many stories in our heads around what's going on that aren't actually right. Um, and then to know what to do with it, how to function better so that we can perform well, um, even in really high demand situations. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, um, you know, mostly in the uh, in the 80s and 90s. So let's say, you know, in the in the early 80s, when I first heard the word therapy, you know, it was ascribed to, you know, a relative that, you know, had noticeable problems that he was coping with. Um, so I always viewed, you know, if you go to therapy, like you're like, you got to be at that level of, you know, re you know, ready to, to kind of drop off the, the face of civilization in order to have to go there. So it was always to me, something that was not something you talk about and hopefully something you never get to. It was never looked at as, you know, the equivalent of personal training, you know, for your body, you know, it's like kind of personal training for your brain. And most of what, you know, stress is, at least for me, and I, I experience it on a daily basis, just in the type of job that we're in, you know, where you're living and dying by deals happening and, and client accounts coming in and not being able to control a lot of the things that you would like to control are just not controllable. So when you take a look at kind of where you were when, when we were growing up or where you were originally, where, you know, it was viewed as a weakness, to yeah. even talk about this to kind of where exactly. we thankfully are now and, and what you think we could do to proliferate it without making people look weak and too vulnerable that they lose some of their leadership skills. It's so amazing how much culture, our culture has shifted since the eighties and nineties, um, since when we were both, you know, growing up, but there are still places where the shift is ongoing. And I think a lot of the reason why we've seen the shift it's not just that our culture has gotten touchy-feely or something, it's that science, Western understanding of the way the mind and body work, it's really advanced tremendously, um, especially since around 2000, all of the understanding of how the brain works, how the nervous system works, how our genetics 
turn genes on or off depending upon our repeated experiences, how that can be shared between generations. Like there's so much more understanding of the complexity of this wonderful thing that is our mind and body. And, you know, when I was learning all of the science and teaching it to all of these people, the thing that really struck me was how much I had been taking personally my symptoms or my moods or mm. the ways that I acted in the world. And learning all of this science helped me under, helped me realize it's not personal. This is a mind and body that gets wired to act in certain ways, that is wired to act out in certain ways when we are experiencing too much stress and we're not recovering from it. You know, in our culture, we spend so much time turning stress on and never turning it off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people hear the word stress, they think, oh, that what, what's going on with me is not stress. But then, you know, they don't necessarily understand how it shows up in all these different ways. Stress shows up as chronic pain, as depression, as weight gain, as sleep problems, as addictions, as chronic, like frequent colds. And we don't usually think of those things as being stress, but this is how the body begins to express all of what has been turned on and not turned off. So just putting all those pieces together and being able to share that with people in ways that they could access agency around it, where they can realize, oh, there's a couple things I could do differently that could have a really big impact on the way I'm moving through the world. It isn't weakness. It's just a mind and body that gets out of balance. And then we need to take active steps to help it get back into balance. That's all. Yeah, somebody said to me the other day, like, asked me a question, like, what, what do you think the best piece of technology you've ever seen? I'm like, how about the human body? Exactly. I mean, like, it doesn't get any better than this. I mean, you've got like five or six different systems going on at the same time, you know, <laughs> mobility, nervous system, stress, survival. Um, so, you know, as you think about before going to adults and what we could do about it, you know, given everything that we've experienced and learned, you know, let's take like my 12, my 13 year old nephew. Like, is there a prescription based on everything that you've learned and what we know now to say, hey, look, we're going to actually teach you, like, we're going to do like a teenage boot camp and we're going to let you kind of not have to deal with what we dealt with and start to train your mind and body and maybe talk about the, you know, the two different sides of the brain and, and make that so we could fix people, not fix, but at least educate them at the beginning so they don't have to go get to the point where, Hopefully they hear this podcast or read your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they'll they'll read the book, they'll hear the podcast, and you know I'm we we're in the middle of post production of an online version of the course, um, the okay. the mind fitness training course that I designed and that we tested um, with with troops, and it will be released in October, so people would be able to to do that as well. I would say one of the advantages that your nephew has um, at, at you know, 12 or 13 years old is that his brain is still extremely plastic. And by that, I mean, it still has the potential to change easily in terms of the way it functions and in terms of the way it's structured a lot more easily than your or my brain. But all of us, doesn't matter what time in our lifespan we are, we can always change our brain, our body, our nervous system through anything that we're doing in a repeated way. And for the Halo audience, everybody understands that about the body. Like if you're working out on a regular basis, you are getting cardiovascular exercise on a regular basis, you're going to see those training specific changes in your cardiovascular right. system, in your muscles. It's the same thing that can happen in the nervous system and in the brain. And it can happen from how we learn to direct our attention. And when we're directing our attention in particular ways, either consciously or unconsciously, whatever we're doing in a repeated way, it's going to have these material effects on our brain and our nervous system. So for your nephew, he's going to have a lot faster impact from some mind fitness training than maybe you or I will, but anybody will see any impact after a couple of weeks. It's pretty clear. And it all comes down to being super aware of where our attention is being pulled. In our culture, most of us, our attention is, you know, totally distracted. It's all over the place. And the, Increase in technology has only made that worse. You know, people have trained themselves to constantly pick up their device and, you know, listen to the to little dings for the texts and, right. and constantly being pulled to watch television or to be on social media. 
And that trains the brain to be super distracted. It trains the brain to have a really hard time focusing. So to complement or to counteract that, we have to set aside particular periods of time, device-free, where we are really directing the attention very intentionally. And you know, the first exercise in the mind fitness training sequence that I developed focuses the attention. This is going to sound really strange, but it really, really works. Focus the attention on the places of contact between the body and your surroundings. So the sensations of like weightedness, pressure, heaviness, dampness between the backs of your legs and your butt and the chair, between the bottoms of your feet and the floor, between your lower back and the back of the chair. And when we direct our attention in that way, and when the mind wanders off, we keep redirecting our attention, it's training attentional control. And that opens up this amazing vista for some important shifts that need to happen in the mind and body. The reason why we go to the butt in the chair and the feet on the floor, that's an attentional target that helps the survival parts of our brain to feel safe and grounded. Um, and that's what helps to turn stress off. Got it. So, you know, when you've dealt with or, or in some of your classes had uh, entrepreneurs or, or people that are running their own company, you know, that there's a level of stress that I think you realize going into, but you don't fully appreciate, you know, the weight that you put on yourself um, yes. and also your ability to be a leader and tell people, hey, this is, you know, this is going to work out without actually knowing if it is going to, but being optimistic to the point of truthfulness, but also the point of aspiration. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how have you thought about people being able to talk about this who are either CEOs or in leadership positions without kind of losing, I wouldn't say losing the confidence, but having like so much vulnerability and transparency that maybe that's, you know, like what, I don't know, they use that like TMI, is that too much information? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a great question, Pete. Obviously, when you're trying to be a leader to followers or you're trying to like pitch a sale for funding or for making the business like grow, you want to have an a optimistic and very confident and very forward thinking and very clear vision. And all of that makes a lot of sense. And so if you might be feeling doubt underneath or a little anxiety underneath or you're really confused underneath, you're not going to want to necessarily show those things. I get that. The, the problem, and that's not a problem with that. Like that is the image you want to project in this situation. The problem is if you can't at the same time acknowledge at least to yourself that underneath there is anxiety or, or frustration or confusion or whatever, because in those emotions is really important information that we need to take into account in our thinking and our decision making. We don't necessarily need to be projecting it and showing it to the world, but we need to be in, aware of it enough so that if we need to change what we're doing or change the timeline or you know, there's, there's usually a really important wealth of information in that emotional cue. So we need to be able to access it. And then we need to also be able to downregulate it if it's not helpful or appropriate for the current situation. So say, say somebody's about to go into a big presentation with a venture capitalist and they're feeling really anxious and really unclear about the future. And they're also frustrated that they haven't had funding before. And so this, you know, roiling emotions underneath. The way that many people handle that is just to shove it under and go in and try and give the image. And then afterwards, they're going to have an, a drink or smoke or something that's going to help them kind of calm the anxiety. A better approach in that situation would be, to be, oh, okay, anxious right now, frustrated right now. Let me stand up and walk quickly around the block, extend some of that, come back and be focused, and then share what needs to, but having acknowledged it first to ourselves. Because sometimes the message in that anxiety is actually a really important message that we're off course, that we need to be doing something different, that we have missed an important cue that is slightly out of our conscious awareness that needs to come into awareness. So emotions are not necessarily always a problem. They're actually useful information. 
And the last thing I would say in terms of leadership around this, our minds and bodies are constantly conveying nonverbal information to everyone around us. Our nervous systems are resonating with everything around us. And so someone might be feeling anxious and frustrated underneath and they shove it under and then they you know, go in and think that they're being very confident. But if their body is still anxious and tense underneath, everyone in that room is going to be picking that up, that nonverbal cue. We have to learn how to regulate that because otherwise we're transmitting it non-verbally. We might think we're being con- you know, very confident, but then our vocal message is very misattuned with what's going on in our body. Sometimes in that moment, the really wise choice is to say, you know what? To actually say out loud, you know what? I'm actually feeling a little anxious. You might be picking that up on me, but you know, here's what I think we need to do about it. That's actually a much more honest and direct way to approach. And people often really appreciate that. So there's a lot, just to summarize all that, there's a lot more choices available to us in how we move through the world. If we can be aware of what's going on in ourselves, and then we can use that information however it's best for the current situation. Yeah, so when when you think of what we've gone through here, you know, with COVID and... um, you know, I picked up on some of the other comments you made in the past about social isolation uh, as one of them, which I believe is kind of the leading causes of obesity, you know, addiction, you know, every, everything starts with, if I don't have confidence in, in being part of some community, and that could be the people next door to me I talk to in the apartment building, it could be that I go to a health club and I go to a, a group exercise class. If I don't have some of that accountability that I need to be anywhere. I feel like a lot of people could go that this COVID could turn into a lot more issues than just, you know, the current, you know, cases and and death rates. I I feel like the collateral damage to take a military term, you know, actually might be even worse than, than what we've experienced. And we haven't even seen, you know, the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, So that's why we're, you know, really focused, as I mentioned before on, you know, loneliness, obesity, and diabetes, if we can figure out a way to get people into a program or to show them a path that, look, we can, we can give you fun, we can make you not lonely, and we can also put you on a path that's not going to be overly challenging. You know, and we're, Dave and I were talking to someone and, you know, they talked about, look, I'm not going into a club and losing 25 pounds in four weeks. It's never happened to me, 52 years old. This guy was saying, it hasn't happened in the last... 35 years is probably not going to happen <laughs> four weeks from now. So like, don't sell me that because I'm not buying that. Right? So, you know, as, as you kind of look at, you know, what we're ahead of and also thinking about everyone's like, Oh, I'm, I'm more efficient when I work from home, but all the issues and the stress that you're talking about now are basically, it's almost like in a bottle and it's about to explode, you know? So what, you know, obviously you've got your book and you've got, classes, but what do you think needs to happen to make sure that this doesn't become the next pandemic? That's a great question, Pete. And I do think that there are already some red flags or at least yellow flags that this is going to be kind of the next pandemic. The domestic violence in this country is actually off the charts right now, which is a lot of people who are really upset and frustrated and just have a tremendous amount of stress that they're externalizing, you know, in a sure. violent way in yeah. their families. There's a lot of people who are overeating, who have you know, the suicide, suicidality has gone up. There's problems with alcohol. Like there's all these different ways that people cope. And when you're alone and you don't have accountability, that can make it even harder. There's a lot of research that shows how much loneliness and social isolation has been linked to epigenetic changes. Those are the changes that happen in our gene expression from repeated Mm -hmm. experience. Loneliness and social isolation have been shown to have epigenetic changes towards chronic inflammation in the body. And chronic inflammation in the body is the root cause behind a whole range of both physical illnesses, including diabetes and obesity, but also a whole range of psychological issues like anxiety, depression, PTSD, dementia, all of these Mm -hmm. things kind of come back to chronic inflammation. And that is often fed by loneliness. So 
With all that in mind, I would say it's really important right now for people, even when we're socially distanced, to be really vigilant about investing time in a very conscious and intentional way in their social networks. Whether that's over Zoom, like we are right now, whether that's getting out in a park where you're all sitting, you know, on your own picnic blanket, you know, six feet apart. By the way, being outside in nature is very regulating too. Our minds True. and bodies regulate with our environment and nature is very grounding for us. So spending time outside, getting enough physical exercise, because that actually helps to counteract that negative um, of chronic inflammation, enough physical exercise helps to reduce that. You know, I think none of it's sexy. It's none of it's a, a, a like quick fix pill, <laughs> but it's super clear what we need to do and whatever people need to build in for the accountability to make sure that they're doing these things on a regular basis. The regular basis piece is what has the effect. The repeated effect is what really accumulates for us. And, you know, in some of your, your, your writings, you talk about accountability and, and, and discipline and a lot of that self-discipline, you know, as you look at, you know, coming out of this COVID situation and people maybe understanding that they can allocate more time to themselves, that, you know, they can do a 20 minute, you know, meditation or, you know, put that hour into yoga instead of putting your hour into you know, whatever else you were doing or, you know, trying to get your emails below 25 so you can see them all on the, you know, Gmail private label, you know, summary. Do you, do you have hope that this pandemic has woken people up or do you think that we've still got a long, long way to go? I have two points that I'd like to make on this, Pete. The first one is not your question. The first one is when you were talking about the need for self-discipline or the sense that we need self-discipline to be able to do things. I think that's a really common understanding in our culture. But what was really amazing to me when I learned all the brain science was to realize how much self-discipline and willpower, they're controlled by the neocortex, the thinking brain. And when we are chronically stressed or when we're experiencing um, kind of constant uncertainty, all of our thinking brain functions get degraded, including our willpower. And so for a lot of people, this is a really vicious cycle time where we know we need to be exercising or we know we need to be eating well. We know we need to be meditating or doing yoga or all of the, you know, we shouldn't be doing, you know, pick your, your stress reaction cycle habit, alcohol, whatever else. But the problem is our willpower is degraded right now. So the first thing I would say is people need to cut themselves a bit of a break and understand that you can't just kind of double down on your willpower and suck it up and just push through in that. You have to acknowledge, yes, this is a really stressful time. Yes, my willpower is degraded right now, but I also understand the best way to get my willpower back is to make some very intentional choices, start small, but little intentional choices to help recover from this stress. So that was not what you asked, but I definitely wanted to say that. What you did ask was, do I feel like this is worse than ever? You know, in two chapters of the book, I lay out a whole lot of different statistics that highlight different facets of the way that resilience in our country is undermined. And the book was published before the pandemic, but I feel like the pandemic has highlighted all of those signs of undermined resilience in spades. You know, the, mm -hmm. the high, high rates of chronic diseases that we have in this country, the high rates of obesity, the things that are making COVID even more likely to be serious for people right. or lethal for people. But I do think there is a major silver lining in this, which is that people have stopped enough, they've interrupted old habits enough, and they have seen some bright sides to having more work-life balance, being a little bit like spending less time in the car, finding ways to work smarter instead of just sitting in the office for X amount of time that's required, you know, finding ways to connect with family in a different way. I think some of those learnings are going to continue afterwards. Um, and I do think too, you know, the, the major amount of protests that we have seen in our country in the last many months 
showing, like really highlighting the injustices and imbalances and inequities in terms of who is more likely to get COVID, who is more likely to have chronic health conditions in large part because of some of the lifestyle factors that are affected by some imbalances. I think there's other places where we're getting more awakened to. And so I think there's, even though it's not been easy to move through any of this, I think all of it has had the silver lining of helping people to become more aware. And I think we're going to have the opportunity to make new choices afterwards. Whether we're going to take advantage of that opportunity, I don't know. But I think the opportunity is on the table now in a way that it wasn't before. So when people um, talk about, you know, what do you want your career to be? You know, most people talk about, I want to be the CEO of this company. I want to build this business and sell it to Google. I want to have a, a house and two kids, whatever, you know. Do you feel like, you know, living a stress-free life might actually start to be top, one of the top three things on people's lists finally? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's possible to have a stress-free life because stress is something we have to have to, mo to mobilize energy to move through the world. But I think living a much more balanced and resilient life absolutely mm -hmm. is going to go much more to the top of the list. And that's, I think, a very welcome change. That's great. So why don't you uh, give, a, give us a little preamble on the, uh, on the book, and, uh, and I'd love to keep in touch here. I think you're going to help a lot of people trying to help the same things that we're trying to achieve. So Absolutely. Uh, so we got wide, widening the window. You want to just give a little background on, on what that means? Yes. So the, the full title, Widen the Window, Training Your Brain and Body to Thrive During Stress and Recover from Trauma. The window is the window of tolerance to stress that each of us have. We start wiring our window when we're still in the womb during the third trimester, and we wire it throughout our life. People with wide windows are much have much more capacity during challenging events. They can keep all those thinking brain functions online. They make the best decisions. They can stay socially connected to other people, even when life throws curveballs. They're way more tolerant during uncertainty, um, which is obviously really needed right now. They're more comfortable with change and they are more resilient. They're healthier, happier people. So everybody's window can be narrowed. And in the book, I lay out the science of the window, how we can narrow it through our lives. And then I lay out how we can widen it. Um, and I'm exhibit A. I was the first person as I was learning all the techniques that I teach, but Thousands of other people have had that effect, thousands and thousands. Um, we did a decade of research, neuroscience research with troops um, before they went to combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. All the published science research is on my website, elizabeth stanleycom if you want to read it. And as I said, we've created a, an online version of the course. I'm partnering with a company called Sounds True, and it will be released in October for people that want to take the, the eight-week course. It all comes down to where we're directing our attention. So the book is three parts. One part's kind of looking at the wider social situation in our country. One part looks at the science. And then the last part, eight chapters, lays out how we actually widen the window, how we gain choice and, you know, be able to act with intentionality, even in really stressful and traumatic situations. That's great. Well, um, I'm going to read the book. We will have... Uh our Halo followers as well. I hereby anoint you as a Halo evangelist. <laughs> Thank welcome, you so much. <laughs> welcome to a lifelong of, of uh, service from here going forward. And uh, let's hope everybody widen the window. I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's great work. And I think the science behind how people feel and making them understand that they can feel better and nothing's wrong with them. We just have to continue to rewire what we already got wired and uh, we'll come out better the other side. So thanks for being on, be safe and look forward to meeting in person. Thank you so much for having me, Pete. It was such a pleasure to talk today and thank you for the work that you all are doing in the world because obesity, diabetes and, and loneliness are really epidemic proportion issues in our country right now. And I think all of the HALO community is really actively countering that and that's really important too we're all widening the window together oh awesome okay great all right have a good rest of the summer thanks. thank you for being on have a good you weekend too thank you, so, thank much. you so much thanks guys bye bye, bye. 
This is Pete Moore. As you know, I am a big believer in personal development. I got a time-saving opportunity here for you, recommending Dan Millman's Four Purposes of Life. Go to audible.com forward slash Halo Talks. You want to register there, get a free audio book. It's $14.95 a month thereafter. Giving you things that I do to make myself better and hopefully it makes you better. Go Halo. Let's play to win.